Now then, if there's one face that I like to see at the start of the year when we are previewing the next 12 months, it is this one. Mr. Dana White, how are you, sir? You good? I'm good, buddy. How are you? Very well indeed. Very well indeed. Um, before we look ahead to 2022 and the shows that are booked uh, and are on the horizon, um, just a quick brief look back at 2021. And from a competition point of view, not a business point of view, because I've, I've heard you speak about it being how successful it was for the UFC last year. But from a competition point of view, nine new champions, seven of which were first timers. When you are consistently putting your champions in with the number one or the number one available contender, does this prove that the competition level in the UFC right now is at an all-time high? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, um, like you said, last year was successful in so many ways, but the way that the fights lined up, we had the absolute best in the world going up against each other uh, every month. And yeah, it's without a doubt. I mean, not only, you know, uh, that, but how stacked every division is and how deep they are with, with crazy talent. Well, when you look at the numbers, yeah. you know, it, it is bringing, you know, a whole nother level of fighter in too. that some kids that we just would have signed now fight their way in against, you know, another kid that probably just would have been signed. And they're, they're, they're both, you, you know, the, these uh, highly touted prospects and, and, and they go in and they fight for it. So, it's uh, it's 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 been awesome. Well, the narratives of those new champions as well. I said seven first timers there. If you're looking at people like Brandon Moreno, first Mexican champion, who obviously had his bumps in the road in the in the way that he built up towards becoming the champion. Charles Oliveira, Francis Ngannou, these type of stories. Glover Teixeira, the oldest first time champion. Those must give inspiration to the other guys, as you're just talking about now in the contender series and various other places. That must give them inspiration in order to think to themselves that it can be done. Nothing is impossible in this organization. A hundred percent. It's, and it's what I love about th this sport and about the UFC is that, you know, these guys who are eventually become world champions have literally fought the toughest men and women in the world to get there. Then they have to fend them off for however long they do. Like a guy like Usman right now, <clears throat> Usman is incredible. Look at the guys he's beat. And now he's on the second, you know, he's starting to beat them a second time. <laughs> you know, it, the guy is, is is the absolute best in the world. He's the pound for pound best fighter on earth. I know that there was big challenges for you last year. How do you assess the last 12 months with the UFC? Oh, it's been great. I mean, the, the last 12 months was obviously a lot easier than the 12 months before that. Uh, 2020 was the roughest year, you know, since the early days, since the beginning. And, uh, you know, I knew we came out of 2020 so strong. I knew 2021 was going to be awesome. I, I, I just knew it. I didn't know what was going to happen or how, you know, what the world was going to throw at us. But I knew it was going to be a, a, a good year. And we, I mean, I could go on for days of all the records that we broke in 2021. Pretty well, much it was. every record from social mm. media to merchandise to pay-per-views, um, you know, fight pass. Uh, commercial pay-per-view, you name it. And it all comes down to the action that was taking place in the Octagon, dishing up stellar fights week after week. What are your challenges then, given what you've experienced over the last two years? What are your challenges coming into 2022? What do you see as the big now, now challenge you gotta, for you? Now you got to go in and beat 2021. <laughs> <laughs> so if you look, every year we've consistently beat the year before us. Every year. So, you know, we, we got to do it again next year. That's that's a tall order. How how big are the challenges, for example, for from our point of view, being being from Britain, for non-US resident fighters getting into s certain states, for example, or certain locations in order to fight? Because as we know, with this pandemic, it's always changing. People are changing jurisdiction all the time on people. And if you're vaccinated, if you're not vaccinated, you can and you can't do certain things. How big are those challenges for you? I, I feel like a lot of this silliness is starting to go away, I think. It, we're starting to, uh, I think common sense is starting to prevail finally. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that, that, that this year we're going to come to the UK. Um, we are going to go to uh, other cities that we haven't been to in a long time. Hopefully uh, more out of the country events. So I I'm hoping that, that 22 is going to be the year. I'm feeling it. How far are you off? You just deluded there 
coming to the UK. How far are you off from being able to announce something like that? Well, I, ho I hope in the next couple of weeks. I'd like to announce in the next couple of weeks that we're coming back to the UK and uh, we're going to go to the O2 and put on a great show for you guys. And we're also working on, on, on big things this year for the UK. So I'm, I'm actually excited about the UK. UK is one of the uh, territories that I'm really excited about and haven't been this excited about it since like 2003 or four or something, you know? Well, we'll get back to that in a minute, my man. Um, we'll talk about the fights that are booked, 270, 271, 272 and various things. Um, by my calculations, five world title fights already in the in the first quarter of this year that are booked in where the champions either taking on the number one contender or an interim champion or the number one available champion. You've got what could be classed, I suppose, in that period of time, four fights that could be classed as title eliminators as well for various divisions, depending how all that plays out. You've got a fantastic grudge match that you've also booked as well. Uh, between uh, Kobe and uh, and Jorge, talk to me about being able to keep that level of competition going in these crazy times, whereas other sports aren't necessarily able to do that. Well, it's the beautiful thing about this sport is that you know when when you have a champion and, and he fights the number one contender, there's always somebody next. There's always somebody new. Or in the case of like um, uh, you know Amanda Nunes who just lost, what's more exciting than that rematch? I mean, I, 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 I think that that fight has the possibility to be the biggest female fight and, and, and pay-per-view history. So, you know, it, it's just, we have, we have every division, the guy who is on top or the girl who's on top is the best in the world. And, and you know, all the way down through number 15 are all studs, all savages, all people that, 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 that are, are incredibly talented and, and want that title. So um, as long as we keep finding young up-and-coming talent with tough, looking for a fight, the contender series and things like that, um, you're going to see nothing but incredible, incredible fights in the UFC and unbelievable main events. You just mentioned tough there. Was it a temptation? Because a lot of fans would have thought that maybe Masvidal and Covington would have been perfect to be coaches on tough. Was there a temptation to use them for that? Uh, yeah, absolutely there was, but the, the, the timing didn't work out. Talk to me about the magnitude of something like that, because non-title fights as main events on, on, on pay-per-views are few and far between, unless your name's, I suppose, McGregor, a Diaz or Anderson Silva. I think we've got to go all the way back to something like a Brock Lesnar before you, you built cards around those type of names. The star power of these two gentlemen and the magnitude of this fight as well has got everybody talking all over the world. Yeah, I mean, it's a fight that people want to see. You know, obviously there's a lot of bad blood and, and, and people love that. And, and it, stylistically, it should be a great fight. On to the heavyweight division, because that's what's kicking us off at UFC 270. Um, listen, styles do make fights. Francis versus Cyril is the epitome of that. You've got power in one corner. You've got technical brilliance in, in the other corner. You must be absolutely salivating at the possibility of a, of a sensational heavyweight year ahead for the UFC. Yeah, that fight, the fight's ridiculous. Uh, you know, one of the one of the best, if not the best, heavyweight matchup ever. You got two guys that train together, two guys that had a falling out now and and and, and don't like each other. Um, one guy has you know unbelievable knockout power, and the other guy you know moves around like a middleweight. Pro probably the best technical striker in heavyweight history. So I mean, you, you couldn't ask for a better matchup. I've been, I've been talking Plus, about this. Both, they're, both, they're both champions. You got one as the yeah. interim title. The other one has the title. Um, everything's on the line, you know, and, and how in-depth the bad blood is between the camps. And, the, you know, just couldn't write a better story than this. The, the fight's fantastic to be able to kick off the year. But the division itself, I mean, there's a lot of fans talking about this that the heavyweight division could, this could be the best ever year for the heavyweight division. What's the latest um, with Stipe Miocic, for example? Are you, are you in contact with Stipe? And I'm sure that if you are, he's there in the shadow, ready to rock and roll with maybe the winner of UFC 270. Yeah, yeah, no. You know, the, the heavyweight division is deeper than it's ever been 
in the UFC. And uh, and yes, Stipe is, is 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 right in there, waiting to see who wins this fight. And uh, yeah, that, we, there's so many things I'm looking at the wall right now that in the next couple of weeks you'll know a lot of other cool things that are going to happen in the heavyweight division. But yeah, it's fun. Going to be a good Can- year. I agree with you. Could, could you see a possibility this year that we do? Obviously, we've got Francis and Cyril competing on, at USC 270, but could you see also a, a full year where Stipe competes, John Jones makes that debut as well, which would obviously just send the division into a different level? Those are a lot of the questions, you know. It all stems off what happens next Saturday night, you know what I mean? So we got to see how that thing plays out, who wins, and then who's next. But there's so many possibilities um, and so many up-and-coming guys and a lot of fun fights coming up in the heavyweight division. Um, I obviously I, I cover quite a lot of boxing as well, and I know that you're a huge boxing fan. And I just want to point something out um, that one of my biggest bugbears in, in boxing are uh, unnecessary rematch clauses. I genuinely believe that fights should dictate whether we get a rematch, or fans should obviously call for those rematches. I don't think that we need to contract them. And I've brought that up because two seven one. This is what fight sports is supposed to look like. Adesanya Whitaker, the rematch there, this is what it's supposed to look like. You had champion versus interim champion came together. One guy lost, but then he went away, rebuilt himself, and earned himself the opportunity to go for that championship again. How impressed have you been with Robert Whitaker's last year to 18 months to get himself back into title contention? Yeah, no, I agree with you 100%. And, and, you know, you've heard me say many times, you know, we looked at a lot of the problems that boxing had, and we, we, we changed the way we did things here. Um, yeah, when a fight happens, people ask me, oh, will you do the rematch after this fight? I have no idea. What if the fight sucks? The fight sucks, then no, I won't. What, what, what if it's a one-sided ass whooping? No, I probably won't do, you know, the rematch. So, yeah, you, the rematches are built off the first fight and um, the performance of the people involved in that fight. Um, and, yes, Whitaker has gone back out, rebuilt himself, and now here he is again, you know, it'll be interesting to see how, how this fight plays out compared to the first one. If we keep moving down the weight divisions into, into welterweight, our fighter of the year on BT Sport was Kamara Usman last year. Um, I think we can fully understand if he wants to take a little bit of a break and have a little bit of family time and a rest. When are you anticipating to see him back in the octagon? Um, we're looking at him this summer. Okay. Um, and obviously from a British point of view, he's the person that will be stood across from him, Leon Edwards. Yep. And you know what? We were in a matchmaking meeting Tuesday. And 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 I want to say this, I want to say this publicly, and I definitely want to say it public publicly to you on your network, because I was talking about how all these people don't want to fight uh Hamza Chamayev. Let's not forget Leon Edwards said yes. When Leon Edwards was next in line for a title, Leon Edwards accepted that fight. Then he got, uh, um, Hamza got hit with COVID and all that stuff happened. So I wanted to clarify, we were talking about that in the matchmaking meeting the other day. And I keep saying nobody will fight him. Leon Edwards accepted that fight and signed the bout agreement. So does that mean Leon fights Kamara next? No, nah, no, nah, I'm just, I wanted to, I, you, you, you <laughs> reminded me when you just said that. And I, I'd been wanting to say that publicly. Did you go snowboarding or something? <laughs> no, why? Because I've got a little bit of a yeah, burn yeah, on my you, face. You got, you, <laughs> got you got a good goggle burn. You, you know, <laughs> that's just my look. That's my look, Dana. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. that's the way I get that. Me too. <laughs> um, <laughs> You just mentioned Hamza, uh, and when we spoke last in New York, obviously we were both incredibly impressed with the way that this guy carry, carries about himself. He and Gilbert Burns are going back and forth quite a lot on social media. Is that a fight that interests you? Is that a fight that you're looking into making? I mean, yeah, any of those guys up there. I mean, he was going to fight Leon Edwards, who's ranked number three. Uh, he could fight Burns. He could fight Luke. Yeah. The, the lightweight division seems pretty straightforward. You've said publicly that Gaethje would be next for Oliveira, who had a fantastic year last year. Uh, I know you've already made Darius against Makashev, which, again, we're only assuming, but that would kind of lead us to the next guy after uh, Justin Gaethje. So that opens up, because you've got a lot of big names there at Lightweight. What do you do with the likes of the Conor McGregor's, the Nate Diaz's, the Dustin Poirier's, the Tony Ferguson's, the Michael Chandler's? That must be a big headache for you. Yeah, well, you, you don't do anything until Conor's ready. 
Uh, Nate Diaz we're working on uh, right now. Poirier is interested in fighting. You know, these are all guys that you're going to see fight uh, this year. Tony. Tony will fight. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. You know, we got to see how all these fights play out. We, we're going to do Oliveira and Gaethje. Um, and then determine who's next for the title. Islam has a fight coming up. So I don't know. I don't know the answers to those questions, who will fight who, but any way you match them up, it's it's all good. You, you just said that you're working on something for Nate there. Um, he's publicly said that he fancies a fight with Dustin. Dustin says that the other way as well. That would be good, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's one we could do. You know, there's a, there's a lot of different things that we could do in that division. What's the uh, what's the latest on Max Holloway? Obviously, he had to pull out of his fight with uh, Alex Volkanovski. What's the prognosis? Has he given you a time of when he, he thinks he could be back? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. You know, those, those are the type of things. It's like, even as long as connor has been out, mm. you know, with the type of injury he has, who knows how long it's going to be or when, when he'll be back. But, uh, you know, it's all good. Let them take time. He'll get 100% and then we'll figure out what's next for them. I know that you've you've made a great fight um, with Alex, with the zombie, but was there ever a temptation to maybe uh, take Henry Cejudo's offer up that he made on social media? What, what was his offer? He was His offer was to step up to 145, step in and take on Alex Volkanovsky. I can tell you this, the, the, the Korean zombie has been here fighting. You know, the, the, this guy's retired. He's been off for how many years now? And wants to come in and fight Alexander Volkanovsky. You know what I mean? You, you, you got guys like like the Zombie, uh, Josh Emmett, the Giga who's fighting this weekend. You know, you, you got these guys that are in here doing it three times a year and, and working their way up. You know, for Cejudo to retire and then just think he should be able to come in and jump into any weight division and take on the champion. It's not how it works. You mentioned a moment or two ago, Nunez Pena could be the biggest women's uh, fight all time in the UFC. And fingers crossed uh, that materialises and we get to see that uh, at some point this year. If Amanda comes back and she wins, is there a possibility of a third fight with Valentina Shevchenko down the line? I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I don't love it. I, you know, those two fought twice. You know, the, the, they're both... You know, the, the, right now they got Valentina, the number one pound for pound female fighter in the world. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know how Amanda drops to number three. That's pretty silly, but she mm. beat she beat Valentina twice, <laughs> and she drops to number three. These these rankings don't make sense uh, sometimes, but uh, yeah, I, I I don't know. I don't know. I I, I don't love the fight. Both girls are are doing their things. You know, obviously, Amanda needs to worry about Juliana Pena right now, not Valentina Shevchenko. And, uh, you know, they're, they're both going to go down as all-time greats. Women's strawweight looks absolutely immense. Rose Listen, is and, and what we were just talking about earlier, if Valentina and Amanda wanted it and the fans want it bad enough, then I'd do it. There you go, then. Hey, there you go. There's a message to the fans. Uh, I was just going to say on, on straw weight, Rose had a fantastic, fantastic year. It looks like Colour Esparza will be next for her. Is that true to say? True. Yep. Cool. Um, and I know that you can't make major predictions regarding locations that you would go to uh, all over the world with, with what's going on with the pandemic. But in Vegas, there's a massive NFL stadium there now. Um is the, there must be a plan for the UFC at some point to do the Allegiant Stadium. And is, is it for this year? Are you planning on maybe doing something there this year? I, I never even think about doing Allegiant Stadium. You know, I, I like being inside arenas. Um, when, when you have a fight, and, and especially, like, let's say we go to England or we go to Australia, or we go to some of these places where they're used to seeing sporting events in soccer stadiums. You know what I mean? It's just, I, I think it's a lot more intimate and has a much mm -hmm. better feeling when you're inside an arena. I like arenas. Like the O2 Arena in London. Exactly. <laughs> Very much like the O2. I love the O2 there you, in London. There you go. So if you are, this, this is my final point, if you are to uh, obviously make the trip to London uh, and the O2 Arena, can we do, and my producer's going to have to take the swear word out of this, can we do a Friday 
in a in a fish and chip shop, Dana, because I'm loving the series that you're doing for the UFC, man. It looks absolutely tremendous. The amount of food that you are that you are getting through in Las Vegas. We need to do some of uh, the English culinary experience, my friend. That's an awesome idea because I don't like fish. So what we could do is you. I would find out from everybody in England what is the best fish and chip place in London, and I'd go try it. There you go, man. I'll get you booked in. I'll look forward Deal. to uh, to that happening in the not too distant future. And I'm uh, just going to tell it, you this: we we will be coming to London. We're going to figure London out. Um, we will come to London, and uh, we got big things coming to the UK over the next couple of years. So I'm really excited about it. So I want to say thanks to all the fans. They they've hung in there for a long time while we scrapped and battled and tried to figure out, uh, you, you know, how to deliver it you know, to you guys out there and, and, uh, we got some, we got some good happening. So I'm excited. Perfect. Dana, thank you so much uh, for your time. Good luck with the first quarter of the year. And we look forward to, uh, seeing you in London, mate. I appreciate it, buddy. Thanks.